So welcome to this talk about Greenlandic. My name is Rita Valiar and I work um, for the School of Slavonic and East European Studies, which has little to do with Greenland. I, I teach Finnish there and I'm also employed by Uppsala University as a senior lecturer in Uralic languages. And I'm Lily Khan. I'm based in the Hebrew and Jewish Studies Department at UCL, and I work mainly on Hebrew and Yiddish and other Jewish languages, but also on uh, minority and endangered languages, which is something that we both have in common and what uh, drew us to become interested in Greenlandic. And we've recently come back from a field work trip. Um, we spent two, over two weeks in Greenland, so you'll see some photos from this trip um, during this talk. And we've previously written a grammar of North Sami for Rautlish, and we're now working on a grammar of West Greenlandic. Don't know when this will come out, 2019 maybe. <laughs> so we're just going to start by um, giving you a little introduction to Greenland. This is Greenland in the world. So it's the world's largest island. Um, and it's part of the Nordic region, although it's actually closer to North America, and that will become relevant as we discuss the language later you'll um, see. But you can see that in the Nordic area, its closest neighbor is Iceland. And the rest of the talk, so uh, we'll give you some background on sort of history of Greenland and the Greenlandic language. You'll see some Greenlandic words. We'll introduce mm -hmm. you to the structure of the, of the language, this fascinating language. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you'll see some pictures, as I said, some bilingual and trilingual signs, and you'll get a chance to work on Greenlandic. Uh, we'll give you an exercise at the end. So first, just a very, very quick overview of the history of Greenland. There's been human settlement there since around 2500 BCE, but the ancestors of modern Greenlanders are believed to have settled in around the 13th century AD or CE. Um, and they're Inuit, so um, this is the uh, group of people that was previously often referred to as Eskimo. So Two week period. Uh, the other big uh, city uh, is Kangerlussuaq, uh, which is the where the airport is um, here. And it's at the end of a fjord, so it's much warmer there than elsewhere. And the conditions are good for, for planes. Um, and the Greenlandic flag, uh, the colors, obviously the, the white symbolizes snow and ice, and the red is the sun. So just a little bit more about the history. Um, around the same time as the ancestors of the modern Greenlanders started to settle in Greenland, um, you also got some small Viking settlements in the south of Greenland. So this was around the end of the first millennium um, AD. And this is the time Eric the Red, well, some say that he was banished there from Iceland, but others say he just traveled there. And he decided to settle there, he's a Viking. And he's said to have given Greenland its name. So it was a marketing ploy to get people to move there to call it Greenland. It's not green at all. I, no, I can tell you. Looks, <laughs> in this map, it looks like it's green. It's not green. It's a Quite snowy and icy. <laughs> icy and rocky. So, um, yeah, so he wants to make the country seem more appealing to other possible settlers. Alas, his marketing ploy did not work out very well because the Viking settlement didn't really survive. Um, so almost all of the population um, of Greenland continued to be um, Inuit, as it still is until the present day. Then uh, Greenland was colonized by Denmark in the 18th century, and it remained a Danish colony until, uh, like, for 300 years. So in this period, Greenlanders started to learn Danish, um, but they kept speaking Greenlandic as well. And
most languages in the world are related to other languages, right? So they descend from a common ancestor, and you can see these similarities in their grammar. to each other and almost mutually intelligible in a lot of cases. Um, and so all of northern Canada is these uh, kind of initiative languages and then you get Greenlandic. So in the middle, although they have different names, it's really like one, one variety, but then politically it may be several uh, varieties. Yes. Okay. So a really striking characteristic of Eskimo Aleut languages um, is that they are polysynthetic, um, which is a term that's used to describe a type of languages that you get in different parts of the world. Um, most, like predominantly the Eskimo Aleut languages and then a lot of Australian languages, Australian Aboriginal languages and a lot of North American um, indigenous languages. And polysynthetic languages um, basically are sort of famous for having very long words that can include what would be the equivalent of an entire sentence in non-polysynthetic languages. So just to give you an example here, so the, these are Greenlandic examples. Uh, the first one is Kaffi Soriarto Ringo. And uh, that means it is said that you are coming over for coffee. So you can maybe <laughs> recognize the <laughs> coffee element there. Sor is like drinking, Yar is coming, and then the Toringo, that's the it is said. Um, and then we have another one, which is a personal favorite of both of us because we're kind of chocolate addicts. So this is based on real life. We regularly eat chocolate. So you've got the chocolate in there, and then you have, um, you have the consuming, and then you have regularly, and then you have a, um, a first person plural suffix, we. Um, and so this is, a, this is another um, very typical characteristic of polysynthetic languages is something that's called noun incorporation, which we'll look at a bit more where you, um, the noun is like kind of um, incorporated or sort of swallowed up by the verb. As if they said chocolate eat we. Yeah, so the chocolate mm. is there before the eating and is one word. Next one is the Canada Minikuvunga. So I've been to Canada before. So you can see Canada there. You have an ending ni, which means in. Then you have i, which is the verb to be. And this niku element is a uh, past if you've been once. And the uh, vunga is i. And then a variation on that theme, you can also negate uh, one of these um, long polysynthetic words, and the negation goes right into the mix as well. So then we get Kanada mi ni kung ni langa, which is quite similar to the other one, uh, but this is, I've never been to Canada. So this ni langa is the I have not, or I not. So you, that gets added on to the have been, and then in Canada. So you get the whole thing in one package. Okay, and here we'd like to show you uh, another polysynthetic language, perhaps. Um, there we go. So what language is this? You know the language? <laughs> so really, it depends on how you analyze things. If English was spelled like this, we could start claiming, oh, it's polysynthetic, it's just one word, it's a sentence. So ultimately, you know, it depends on the analysis and the approach you take. And so um, it's been suggested that one of the reasons that polysynthetic languages are likely to be um, minority languages and indigenous languages are because um, they are typically languages that had an oral tradition until quite recently. So if, if the language is primarily oral and it doesn't have a written tradition, then when it came to be written down, it was like kind of exoticized by um, missionaries and linguists who were like, my goodness, this is crazy, you've got these giant sentences. When maybe if they had divided all of these suffixes, which we'll be looking at into and written them as separate words, we might have a completely different 
um, perspective on how Greenlandic is. In a lot of ways, as you'll see, it, it does make sense to think of it as polysynthetic. Um, but just keep in mind that some of this is to do with perceptions. And you know, if you wrote English like this, and we treated all of those different words as different suffixes, then we, we could definitely argue that English is polysynthetic. Mm, and English is a lot harder than you think, because mm. everyone hears it early in their life, and that's why it's considered to be easy. But yeah, let's say aliens came down now and wanted to analyze English, it, it would be hard to do things they would have to look at. OK, let's look at the sounds of Greenlandic. It has three vowels only, and cross-linguistically, it's a very small system of vowels, just to have three. And they are i, u, but they allow rather variations. So for example, the u is sometimes pronounced as o, the i is pronounced as e, and even the a is sometimes a, depending on the context. So they, OK, three vowels, but they have um, different variants, let's say. Um, and then you've got 13 consonants, which is also quite a small number. Um, so as you can see here, the the whole like system is is quite easy in terms of like kind of learning to um, pronounce Greenlandic and um, learning to read and write because you have this you, there are no diacritics except for in the loan words which we'll get to in a minute and it's all sort of like quite um, limited um, in terms of what you have to um, remember in terms of sound. So the consonants are g, h, y, k, l, m, n, p, q. This one. Um, if any of you are familiar with Arabic, it's the same sound as um, as kuf in Arabic, so qa, ha, or uh, kuf in Hebrew. R, s, t, and v. And then the double consonants, the f is uh, well, two s, um, so specific. The g, g, that's misleading because it's actually pronounced like the German ich, so it's uh, ichu, for example. The l you have in um, Welsh, uh, so for example, the word for you, singular, is ichli. And then the R R is a very strong sound. It's like <laughs> here in the throat, that kind of sound. And then, like I mentioned, you do get some other letters um, that are used for loanwords borrowed from Danish. So um, this is just a sampling of them. Um, but if, if any of you um, speak Danish or another Scandinavian language, then um, y obviously you have letters like B, C, um, and you know like X and Y and um, letters like Z that are used in loanwords. And then you also get the um, specifically um, Danish and um, Norwegian letters ö and o and a or e, um, which you you'll see in a minute when we show you some Danish loanwords in Greenlandic how, how these crop up quite a lot and it makes them easily identifiable as loanwords. Uh, now we'd like to play a clip. So this is just to give you a feel of what Greenlandic sounds like, so that as we go into the uh, the rest of um, the presentation you, you can have in mind um, how, how it is sort of like in action. So this is um, a clip from the um, Greenlandic um, Daily News. So Greenland has um, a national TV station um, which, which got broadcast primarily in Greenlandic. And if you get really into it, you can watch this on YouTube. It's on YouTube. <laughs> so this is just the first minute of a news program that's talking about local elections and it shows you um, Nuuk, the capital city. So 
So you can see a few things from this. One, it gives you an idea of um, what Greenlandic sounds like. Um, and it also, um, you can also see that you've got the subtitles in Danish. Um, and so that's just an illustration of how everything is, is bilingual in Greenland. So uh, it, as we go on later, we'll show you some signs. And you can see like, sometimes the Danish is in the kind of prime position. In this case, it's, um, it's just in subtitles. But you'll get everything in Danish and Greenlandic one way or another. Um, and um, it also kind of gives you quite a sort of typical view of that was like the main street of Nuuk, the capital city. We um, waited for the bus there many times. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the man was wearing sunglasses, they're essential because it's very bright. <laughs> and he wasn't sure whether he was going to walk there or not. Also topical. Um, OK, so if we go on now to give you a bit more of a picture of what the language actually looks like now that you've you kind of had a taste of what it sounds like. So first, we're going to illustrate the point that Greenlandic is by no means an, an Indo-European or, or Germanic language. It's very different. So here are some basic words. Uh, for example, angut is a, is a man. And English man is related to, I don't know, the German or Swedish man. Um, then you have fingasut, uh, which means three. And you can see how different that is as well. So if you think of you know, kind of different um, Indo-European languages, um, the words for, for three, you have obviously three in English, and then you have Tres in Spanish, um, tri in most of um, the Slavonic languages, <coughs> um, something starting with, with t. Um, and so fingatsut is completely different. Qamat is a moon. Same there, it's not related to anything you see in Europe. And then um, maybe even more impressively, uh, Monday is a ta singol uh, which is based on the word for first, um, or one, a ta um, which is also quite different, um, probably from anything that you've, um, that you've ever heard unless you're familiar with another Eskimo Aleut language. A oh, sack is a hand, and hand is a, in Germanic languages the same in most of them. Um, and then kigut, two. So this is another word that's ki kind of quite often used to um, sort of compare, um, you know, if you're looking for um, resemblances between different languages, historical resemblances, um, you know, tooth is another one that often has a t or a d, certainly in Indo-European languages. Yeah, so you take body parts and basic verbs, and these are the things you compare. And then we have table, which is nechivik. Um, and that one is actually based on the word to eat. So it means like a kind of eating surface. Um, and we'll see a bit later how that happens, how you can build up words like that. Um, but also, obviously, completely different from um, the sort of you know, romance um, languages. Um, and then finally, we have ahlaupok, goes. Um, so this is like, again, if you compare this to Germanic language, um, Completely different, and it's also you know, like sort of different to um, probably in anything that you've seen in another language. The pop ending we'll be seeing a lot. That's the third person singular ending um, that's used for the, the present slash past, which we'll talk about in a minute. So it's kind of like he or she does or did something. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, okay, we talked about Indo European, but this doesn't resemble Uralic, Finnish, or any of these, or Semitic, or no. German, nothing like that. So it's totally different. Completely different. Um, so moving on a little bit um, from that, just to show you some more um, like kind of typical Greenlandic vocabulary. If you think for think of words that um, like Greenland is particularly associated with, it's um, the um, animals. Um, so we have tuttu is reindeer, um, which which are quite common in Greenla Greenland. Um, nanok is the polar bear. Um, so it's usually in, in Greenlandic it just it's translated as bear, it just means bear, but it actually refers to the polar bear because that's the kind of bear that is bear. And the um, puisi, seal, um, so this is a puisi, but then there's also usuk, um, which is a bearded seal. So no, this is a bearded sorry, seal. Yeah. That was a, usuk yeah. is the non bearded there are many seal. Other, many yeah. others. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you have matak, which is um, whale skin. And we mentioned this just because it's a really um, common kind of Greenland, like traditional Greenlandic um, food, um, which on this point, if, um, if you're a vegetarian or vegan, um, you'll be are. happy to, <laughs> yes, you'll be happy to know that like Greenland is actually a vegetarian vegan paradise. Um, and because a lot of people were saying to us like, oh, how will you manage what will you eat? And that you can get everything in Greenland. Um, you can get organic tofu and whatever you should desire. Um, but matak is, um, is like a kind of common traditional. Yeah, so it's whale, whale blubber. It's uh, a bit gross. We didn't see any of these animals when we were there because we were in town. I saw one raven, many dogs, and one cat. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, none of these. Okay. 
then um, often you say that Greenlandic has many, many words for snow. I've chosen four words for ice. This is not, I mean, once again, it's to do with exoticizing. I mean, Finnish has billions of words for ice as well, but you don't see this usually. So um, the first one is siku, which is um, sea ice or lake ice. So ice on the sea or a lake that you can walk on. Then you have sermek, uh, which is um, a clay glacier, a glacier. So it's steady ice that's there all year round. And you have on the bottom uh, right is iluliak which is an iceberg. We saw these, definitely, year round. And Nilak, what am I illustrating here, is the kind of ice that you go and get from a fresh water source, so frozen ice, that you then bring home and melt for, I don't know, drinking or washing yourself with. So fresh water ice that you bring with you to melt. They have, I mean, tap water, and obviously we don't have to do that. This is, but like traditionally, there are some um, children's books um, that we um, that we were um, reading that are from the early 80s, and um, they're like kind of a saga, like a series about um, a boy called Tukkiapsi, which is the Greenlandic for um, Tobias. And in those stories, he and his brothers like go out to get the ice in like this. So it's kind of not that ancient history. And in those books also, they have kaffi mik, which is um, a very important part of Greenlandic culture, where you have coffee. Um, and something to eat with it, and you drink two cups, you stay for two cups, and then, then you go. And that was why, yeah, the brother needed to go out and get the ice to bring back so that they could make the, the coffee for the coffee mix for his birthday. Um, so, um, this is like something else that is kind of traditionally associated with Greenland, and it's going to come up again later because um, you'll, you'll see some examples with this. So, um, a dog sled is a is a kamutit, but there are two words for it. So this is kind of an interesting thing that sort of illustrates um, some like kind of how closely language and culture are related. So kamutit is the sled, as you can see it in the picture, where it's just on its own, like if it was going to be repaired um, or when it's being built. But then there's a different word, kimusit, um, which means the the sled when it's got the driver and the dogs attached and it's in use, as you can see in the picture behind. Um, and then on the bottom right, you've got kamik, which are the like kind of traditional Greenlandic um, boots. Um, and so, you, like again, you can see from all of this vocabulary that this is there's nothing that this is related to. If you think of like the word for boot in any language that you might know, um, now I should say that those boots are made of seal skin. That like the puisi, yeah. Mm. Um, so, looking at this vocabulary, it might kind of all seem sort of really, really different from anything that you know, but um, there are actually some Greenlandic words that have been borrowed into English, even though Greenlandic is not a language that you typically think of as a great source of borrowings in English. Um, but there are a few very high profile ones. Can, can you think of any? Think about the culture. If not, we will show you. No, no, don't, don't, not don't show them. Okay. So <laughs> when you, on the, you go fishing and there's a type of canoe which is called kayak. kayak, there we go. And then a house, what sort of houses do you think of? Igloo, yeah. there we go. And then an outfit, I'm not wearing one, but especially with the hood and the anorak, there we go. Excellent, okay, so these are the words. There are th like three of them, um, as far as we know. That's so igloo, which is just a house in Greenlandic. It's not a house made out of ice. It's not an igloo, it's just the word for house. Um, but, but that's where the English word igloo comes from. Um, kayak, um, the kayak, and then uh, anorak. Um, so the man is so wearing an anorak. So to uh, parties or like weddings, they wear white anorak like that. Mm -hmm. But then on the left, you've got an old, probably seal skin one. Okay, so um, more data. We're going to look at some of the Danish loan words. So if you know English will help here, and if you know uh, Scandinavian language, that will also help possibly the knowledge of German. So. For example, the first one is palasi, so they would have borrowed this word and uh, while they were uh, converted to uh, the Christian um, religion. And it's basically priest, prast in uh, Danish. Um, and in a lot of the older Danish loan words, you can see how they were incorporated into the Greenlandic sound system. So this combination prast um, from the Danish didn't exist and doesn't exist in Greenlandic, and so instead you get palasi. Um, and then the same thing goes for this next one, kuta, which is from Danish kudag, so good day, me meaning hello, and that's like kind of the standard word for hello in Greenlandic, kuta. 
Um, and then you can see again that that one has sort of been adapted slightly. Uh, you can also say uh, alu or halu, which yeah. is kind of nice. Uh, Kasipat is supposedly a Greenlandic version of Kasper. Sometimes the, the way they bear these names, they look very different. Uh, but yeah, Kasper is a typical uh, Danish name, and this is the version of it. And then for those of you who speak uh, Danish and Norwegian, you'll be familiar with the uh, pølse, the sausage. So this one has just been incorporated straight into Greenlandic. This is more recent loan word. And so you see you've got the ø, uh, um, which is this... Um, um, letter for the sound earth that's used in Danish and Norwegian, and um, sometimes you get it's written with an with an I, so pulsi, um, because that, like we we said before, Greenlandic doesn't really have the e sound um, e, but you often get it um, spelled like this as well. And sukkeli is quite obvious. That's also sometimes spelled uh, differently with an s instead of um, uh, a c and a y would be an i. Yeah. Um, so numbers, um, this is a, a really interesting feature of Greenlandic is that um, the Greenlandic numbers are used from 1 till 12 and then above 12 it's Danish numbers. Um, and this was something of a particular <laughs> challenge for us because um, I speak Norwegian and Rita speaks Swedish, um, but the numbers in Danish are completely, the bigger numbers are completely different from <laughs> Norwegian and Swedish. So that was like kind of one of the hardest aspects. It was actually the Greenland hardest thing. <laughs> and <laughs> like somebody like, numbers. look at page so and so. I was like, I don't know what page <laughs> to look at. <laughs> So Femten is 15, that one is fine. If you okay, and then this language, is my nemesis, probably the half tres is, is 50. How can it be? Because it's half of three, tres, three times 20. So 50 is like almost 60, which is three times 20. This is how it was. So very <laughs> difficult. <laughs> but it's not. It's quite usual in minority language situations where you use numbers from other language, um, the majority, like language majority language from, I don't know, in this case from 13 onwards or 20 onwards. Um, it's quite <laughs> typical. Um, then we have um, Juhli from uh, Danish Jule for Christmas. Um, so you see that one has also been incorporated into kind of become Greenlandicized Juhli. And that's your Jule, Yuletide, that's yeah. the same word. And then we have Achusti, which is August. So the months are easy. The days of the week are Greenlandic, apart from Sunday, which is uh, Sabati. Sort of Sabati. But then the months are Danish, so that saves some time if you're learning Greenlandic. Okay, so now that you've got a bit of an idea of what the vocabulary looks like. Um, we can look at how Greenlandic builds words. So we saw earlier um, this case where you had nechidik um, table, which is kind of made up of uh, the word for eat and then like kind of a, a, a plate, a su suffix that means like kind of place. So now you'll see lots more of this. So this is like kind of a very basic level of how Greenlandic builds words. So you have a sort of a, a basic word like a, um, a noun. So um, Ali Sagak, uh, fish, the noun. And then you can take this pok ending that we saw before, which means he or she, and you get Ali Sapok, Ali Sapok. So which that means she or he fishes, she or he fished. So, um, so an important aspect of Greenlandic, which is often really kind of surprising if you're coming from the point of view of, of many other language families, um, is that there is one tense that's used for the present or the past. Um, which is interesting because a lot of times, it, so you might be used to with a lot of European languages how you have past, present, future, and then you know like variations on those like past continuous or something, but distinct kind of tripartite division, past, present, future, um, and then in some languages um, like um, Finnish you have um, past, past and present, but, we have but no, no future. future. <laughs> <laughs> but a d difference between the past and the present, which is the point. So Greenlandic is the opposite of that. It's got um, one verb form for past or present, doesn't matter. Um, and then it, it has a suffix, which we'll see soon, for um, indicating the future. So the future has to be marked, but the present and past are the same. So that's ali sal pok. Um, and then if you put on this pok suffix, that means somebody who does something. So ali sal pok is a fisherman. Um, and then the nek suffix is an abstract noun. So ali sal nek is like kind of the concept of fishing, or sometimes it's used for like a fishery, but sort of fishing in the abstract. Um, then we have Ali Sariut, um, a fishing vessel, and um, our beloved suffix fik, Ali Sal fik, a fishing spot. So this fik you'll see a lot. Um, this is like kind of a place where something happens, and it's the same suffix in, in the word for table, nechidik. Um, 
and, uh, and then Ali Saad, a fishing line. So you can see how um, just by using these few suffixes, you can really sort of get a lot of mileage out of this one base word. <laughs> um, so in some ways, that actually makes Greenlandic quite easy to learn because if you, if you, if you just learn this one word, Ali Salak, then you have all of these different words that you can get out of it. If, but you have to learn the suffixes. And there are about 500 of them. Yes. <laughs> so it's an intrinsic part of the Greenlandic language with suffixes. So there are separate books which are called suffix, so en books with endings. And that's what we spend most of our time, time doing. They're learning a lot of these suffixes, these endings. And we're going to uh, introduce you to our favorite one. So this is a random selection. It's not random because we like these ones, but there are <laughs> loads and loads more. Uh, so the first one is suak, which is in the middle. Uh, that's the actual suffix. So it either means big or stupid. So it probably causes some confusion sometimes. But we've attached it to ilhlu, the house. So ilhlu suak is a big house. And then if we'd attach to the word for man we saw earlier, anguk, which would be angus suak, a, a stupid man. It could be a big man as well. I don't know. But uh, we translate it as a stupid man here. It depends. Like kind of some, some words are sort of just more likely by their nature to have one meaning than another. Um, so... Then you get um, sinipok, um, sleeps or slept, plus thick, the place. You get sinitik, which is a bed, so a sleeping place. Mm -hmm. uh, kaffi, uh, which is, we said was important in the culture. If you attach this sor or torpok, which is like consume or eat or drink all these things. We saw it earlier. So kaffi sorpok is, uh, would be drinks coffee. But you could have anything. You have kagi there, like cake, or you could have, I don't know, what else did we have? Uh, that wonderful dish matak. we saw matak earlier, so that you eat whale blubber. Um, and then we have bili kar, which is a Danish loan word. So it's got the b, which you wouldn't get in a um, in a Greenlandic word. Um, mm. And then you have the suff. Oh, we skipped. Sorry, because there's kaffi solpok. I skipped ahead of kaffi solpok. Sol sol talpok. So iflu house um, plus the suffix sivok to buy, which is interesting because this is another example of noun incorporation where you get the noun and then you stick a suffix on which kind of turns it into a verb. Um, and the noun is there, but it, so it's like, it's tr translated as an object in English, but in Greenlandic it's just one word. So ichlu sivok, buys a house or bought a house. That's all you need, that and one like word. like this house buys again. Yeah. And here's coffee sorpok. We're using this thing we built earlier as a base, so drinks coffee. And they like adding this suffix tar or tarpok to things. And it sort of means habitually, he does something regularly or usually. So coffee so tarpok is someone usually drinks coffee, tends to drink coffee. So if you ever like kind of want to specify that something is done regularly, like say um, I, I go to university, um, if it's something that you do more than once, then you put in this tar suffix. So that's obligatory. It's kind of like a compulsory element of the verb. You have to kind of distinguish between something that you do once and something that you do regularly. Um, okay, so now bili, um, car. So this erpok suffix is um, something that can be used to make a noun into a verb, and it's used quite commonly with um, with loan words. Not not only loan words, but it's very common with loan words. So you take bili, you put erpok on, and then you get bilerpok, which means he or she drives or drove a car. Um, and then we can build on that and use this bilerpok as our base and add sinnavok to that, which is can. So there's a suffix that means can. This is not uncommon. There are other languages that have this, but the the combo becomes bilerpok sinnavok which is can drive a car. Few more. More suffixes. So the this is tricky. So this ina, so this is for you. Do you want to do it? Okay, I'll do ina. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a really interesting feature. So we have the, the noun ina, and then there's a suffix sak, uh, which means future, and it's related to the verb form. There's a verbal suffix sa, which, which gets attached to verb. So some suffixes are attached to nouns and some are attached to verbs. So you can like kind of have these long chains where you have a noun that becomes a verb that then becomes a noun that then becomes a verb yeah. again. It's really fun. So you get in a sock, <laughs> future room, which sounds like kind of sci-fi, but it just means like kind of say if you're going to move into a house and you can say that's my uh, in a sock with a possessive suffix as well because Greenlandic has those two. But um, so this is like the room that I'm going to have, but I don't have it yet. Mm -hmm. And this is the word from our uh, blurb uh, to this talk. So karasak is brain. And you can attach the suffix to that asiak, which is made like. And that then becomes a computer. So karasasiak uh, is a computer, something that's made like a brain, so like an artificial shaped brain. Um, and then we have pok, which we saw before, meaning goes. Um, and then you have the suffix lerpok starts to. So ahla, ahla lerpok is starts to go. 
Mm -hmm. That's something else that you can incorporate into a single word. And this one we struggled with a long time, this color box. Uh, so, okay, neri vok is the, someone eats, and then yeah, there's this color box to that. If it's like, would have done it, so maybe, uh, I would have done it, but that's the implication. So, neri color box. So, we hadn't seen a suffix like that before in other languages, but. Uh, yeah, it's and quite it's cool. Yeah, and it's really common. So you see this all the time. It's any any time something is like, didn't happen. Like the intention was for it to happen, but then something went wrong and it didn't happen. And then like, like the robbery or the break-in yes. attempt we read in the news, and they had this ending there. There was an attempted break-in, so it's like they would have broken in, except dot dot dot. That's galwalpok. Mm -hmm. um, then um, we have kagi cake, plus liopok. Um, so liopok is makes, and then you get kagi liopok makes a cake. Clip is you, and lu is a um, slightly different kind. It's like it's not an enclitic particle, it's just it's attached to the to the end, and it means and or also. So is uh, and you, and that's what you say when someone says thank you to you, that's usually the, what you hear back, so you also. Um, then we have atuarfik, which you can see already has this fik suffix. So atuarfok is studies or um, reads. So atuarfik, school, place where you study or read, um, plus taq, meaning new, you get atuafitak, a new school. Uh, we'll talk more about the equivalent of adjectives in Greenlandic in a minute, but for now you can see that this is something that you might not be used to seeing. Um, I certainly am not familiar with this from any other language that, that I'm familiar with. Um, a new school where new is a suffix. And then we have iklu again as our base, and then the suffix there, kok, which means ruined, former, or ex. So a ruined house would be iklu kok, but then we had a bit of a misunderstanding, me and our uh, consultant, because we were working with a native speaker there, and she said, oh, I was on Skype, this is all in Greenlandic, I was on Skype with my ruined colleague, and I was like, what, what is she <laughs> saying? She meant a former colleague, but I'd learned the other meaning of the, of the ending, and I thought, is, is the colleague in hospital? What's happened to me? But they were okay, they were just former colleagues. Okay, so now that you've seen a little bit about how this kind of um, thing can work with the suffixes, let's look at some more interesting features of Greenlandic sentences. So. Um, we have these two Greenlandic sentences here, um, which are not that long, so you don't necessarily have to have a gigantic word as a sentence. You can have sort of, m you know, two or more smaller words. So we have pitak nerivok, pizza eats or ate. So pitak is like the Greenlandic for um, like care or um, pizza, and nerivok um, we've already seen in a few different permutations, eats or ate. Um, so the interesting thing here, the first thing, is um, that you can see that you've got these two sentences. The first one doesn't have an object. So if you have, um, if you have a sentence, you can have um, a sentence that just has a, a subject and a verb, like eats, right? And then you can have a sentence like the second one, pitak itiak neriva. So Peter eats the bread or ate the bread. So in the second sentence, you've got an object, bread, the thing that's being eaten. So um, a lot of languages that you're probably more familiar with are um, languages that either don't have a case system or have a case system where the subject is in the nominative case. So if you think of you know, like Latin or Russian, and then the object is in the accusative case. So right, it's the one that's having the object done to it. So Greenlandic has a different system, which is called ergative absolutive. So the, instead of a nominative, it has an absolutive case, which is the pitak case. And that is used for um, the subject of an intransitive verb, so the subject of a verb that doesn't have an object, like the first sentence. But then the same case is used for the object of a transitive verb, so the object of a verb that has got an object. So in the second sentence, you can see the second word, um, that's, that's the same case, it's the absolutive case. In this case, they both happen to end in Q, but they don't necessarily have to end in Q. Um, but that, in this case, that makes it easier to recognize. You can see that pitak and then itiak they're both the same. That's like the basic form of the noun. So it can be the subject or the object, which is quite different if you're used to languages with nominative and accusative. And then what happens to the subject in a transitive sentence? The subject of the verb that's doing something to an object. See, it has the P, P tak. Um, so this is called the, um, the ergative case. So if you have a subject in a verb, in a sentence with an object, it gets this different case and the object like kind of stays the same as, as the, um, the subject of an intransitive sentence. So that's something that is, it, you get that in, in different languages um, across the world, but it's um, something that is often not familiar if you're used to studying um, um, European languages, not only European languages. Um, it feels a bit uncomfortable. To it's <laughs> it's quite different, something to get used to. 
Um, then another thing that you can see in the second sentence is that you've got the verb at the end of the sentence. So um, Greenlandic is what's called an SOV language, where you have the subject, then the object, then the verb. Um, and another thing that's really interesting is that if you look at the two different verbs, nerivok and neriva, you can see that the verb has changed. Um, and that's because in Greenlandic, if you have a transitive verb, a verb with an object, you have to, you have to mark the subject and the object in the verb, and it gets a different ending. So we'll see more about this um, in a minute. But it's basically um, the, um, the ending has changed completely. You can see it's the same stem, neri, but the verb form is different just because it has an object. And so this, this um, ending, va, means he or she, subject, plus he, she, it, object. And there's more of this. I'm not going to go into too much detail with this because it's slightly on time. But for example, if you look at the first three, the subject is constantly I. So I, I'm the one doing the answering. But the object changes, and that's why the endings are different. So that's, that's the bottom line. I'm not going to go into the other examples now because we want you to work on the language as well and save time for that. OK, so one more exciting feature of Greenlandic, which is often surprising if you're used to um, like many other languages, is that Greenlandic adjectives are verbs. <laughs> so officially, there's no such thing as an adverb in Greenlandic. Um, and you can see some examples of this here. So, alsak a palu pok, the ball is red. So you can see our familiar pok ending. It's a verb. So um, how would you like translate like the ball red is? Or yeah, something? the ball. Yeah, and then you can redness you is. Mm -hmm. You can't really translate it very well. And arnak kasu pok, the woman is tired. Same kind of idea. Taski um, okima pok, the bag is heavy. It's the and same. And filimi ayungni lak, the film is scared. But they're verbs. So when you get trying to say the adjective, they're like, no, 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 no adjectives. We're like, okay, sorry. Uh. And quickly, just to show, Greenlandic has cases which you might be more used to. So it has a rather small inventory of cases. Um, so for example, um, the mut is to a house. So iknumut is to the house. Locative is in, so iknumi in a house and so on. This is not too bad. The instrumental means like with the house or I don't know, with the ben or mm, by car. And the prolative kut is by a house or via the house. You go somewhere via the house. And equative is at the house. So I use this, this um, I don't know, room at my house or something like that kind of sentence. He, uh, OK. So um, we promised that we would show you some signs so you can see what Greenlandic looks like in action. Um, and so these are all signs that were taken in uh, Nuuk. Um, and so you can see um, how um, you've got the bilingual, um, you always have at least Danish and Greenlandic. So um, in the, the one on the top right, you've got the Danish on the top and then the Greenlandic underneath. Um, like so you see that variation a lot. Um, usually if it's something to do with um, like kind of road, road safety, um, like traffic signs, you often get the, Greenland the Greenlandic on the bottom. Um, and you can see sikumi, the top word in the Greenlandic section, is the siku, which is the lake ice or the, um, the sea ice. Um, and then you have, in the second word, you have nek, which is the abstract suffix. So that's like kind of on the ice, the mi is, is uh, the, the locative, and then you have on the ice. So on the ice, driving, and then the bottom word is forbidden. Um, and then on the bottom right, if we go, if we go clockwise, um, you can see this one is a hospital. In Nuuk, um, and so you get the Greenlandic on the top here, and then the Danish underneath. Um, but then sometimes, if it's in an international context, or it's something that's like kind of really, really particularly vitally important, then you get Greenlandic, Danish, and English. So the um, the bottom left is is like explosions. <laughs> so that's in all three languages. Um, and then the university, um, the University of Greenland in Nuuk, has also kind of international and so it's got the three languages. Mm, and obviously tourism would also be in all, anything to do with tourism is in all three languages. Uh, here are some other signs. So Pacific is a shop uh, from Sivok. We had that verb to buy and the fifth is a place. And then it's in both languages at the top. So Uksutamasa is every day. No smoking. Uh, here is a negative imperative, so don't smoke. Uh, this was near where we were staying. You have very modern things in Greenlandic as well. So everything is in Greenlandic, like the how was your shopping experience uh, on the on the bottom left. And minute means for dogs. So this is dogs 
parking where you can leave your dog when you go to the library. This is in the hall of the library. Mm -hmm. And then about products in the shop. So most things are, the labels are in Danish, but this is a, lo a cap coffee uh, brand. And it's sort of adapted or for green, um, the water, because they have a, hot, they don't have much lion's tail in mm -hmm. there. So, th so they need different kind of coffee. So this is uh, adapted also. Juice concentrate and powdered milk, they had labels in Greenlandic, but otherwise it's Danish pretty much. Okay, so now we're going to hand over to you. <laughs> and we've got a list of uh, words and phrases and sentences on the left. Sometimes you, you might be, uh, you know, a sentence in, in the one word. Um, and then on the right, we've got a list of bases, so either noun or verb bases and suffixes. Um, and together, this is all you need to be able to work out what the words on the left mean. So this is just a kind of taster, so don't worry if you can't figure them all out. Um, if you just say with the person next to you, um, and you might have to move closer together, just see what you can work out. You could, you know, just start with the first three, um, and then we'll come together at the end and, and go over them. Do you have about okay. five, six Like five six minutes, so five yeah. Five or six minutes. Don't panic, don't worry if it seems really difficult because it can be. <laughs> that there has been a slight change in one of the bases, um, and that can happen. <laughs> so, so when it's just that's not mechanical, sometimes the suffix might change the base. So, so for example, Q at the end of a word often turns into R. That's one to look out for. Um, and sometimes the last consonant will disappear. And this is all to do with the suffixes. Some suffixes um, like kind of uh, swallow up the last consonant of the whatever has come before, and some of them let it stay. And some of them turn it into an R. <laughs> so <laughs> that's all you need to know for now. <laughs>
Sounds good. I yeah, you know what you're doing. Yeah. So we're recreating the experience of doing field work in in Greenland with these with these examples. So does anyone have an idea what the first one means? Ithbiausi saavut. Uh, yes, so ith, you start with ithbiav, which you can then kind of trace back to ithbiak, rye bread, and then, which is like kind of the standard kind of bread in, in Greenland. Um, and then um, sivok, um, which is, or si, um, which is to buy. So this is another verb that can swallow up a noun. Um, and then sa, which is the, um, the future suffix, and then gut, which is the first, uh, first person plural. So Excellent. And then we have Pimmer Rosuakarpunga. What does that mean? Excellent. Yeah, bid. Let's say bid. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> Brilliant. So Kimmek is dog. Then you have the swak, the pig, and kar is to have, and punga is I. Well done. Okay. Kagili or Rusupugut. Just a just a cake. cake. Yeah, just yeah. a cake. <laughs> yeah. So there's no suak, but you could you could do that. You could say kagi sua kagi sua liol sufugut, and then it would be I want to make a big cake. So yeah, kagi cake liol is make, rusuf is want, and then fugut is um, it's another variant of the we suffix again. Well done. Excellent. Kalal shisut okalusina vunga. Beautiful. So Kalal is just the language, and then Okaluk, that's to speak, Sinna can, and Bunga I. Well done. Excellent. Did anyone get to Inusiak? So this what is on earth is that? This is a really interesting <laughs> one. Um, okay, so it, it mean literally means mortal person. Um, and if you think of, um, if I say it doesn't mean a mannequin, if you think <laughs> of like the Greenlandic context. Another robot. Not, not a, a robot. robot. If you think specifically of like kind of Greenlandic n nature, oh. huh? Snowman, snowman. exactly. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you have the word for snow in front of it, I should say. Yeah, sometimes, yeah, but not ne not necessarily. And then pilar shinang ilanga. What does that mean? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So pilar does to dry sinna is the can, and then you have the negation, and then I. Brilliant. Did anyone get to numing ilagut? We're not in Nuuk. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So Nuuk, the capital of Greenland, um, and then when you add this um, this me or me folk to be in a place, then it loses its final k, so it becomes numni, which can make it a bit harder to recognize. And then you've got the negative nila, and then gut again. And then the verb to be is just the e there that hides. Kayar uh, tor tarpunga. Any suggestion? Exactly. Mm -hmm. You have a big dog and then you do this as well. <laughs> <laughs> Next, please. Uh, so, anyone? That's really... Uh, exactly. The opposite. Yeah, like, I know. So, I don't not know. <laughs> so, this is a really interesting one um, because um, Greenlandic is the only language that I know where um, the w you start off with the like kind of the basic verb means to not know. So there's so the, the, the stem nalu means to be unknowing, to be ignorant of, and then you make that negative, and then it becomes I know. Mm -hmm. And then the last one, kimusser tang nilagut. Mm. Oh, I don't tend to do it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Well yeah. done. Fantastic. So, kuyanak, thank you. Um, and we've got a couple of minutes for questions, if anybody... Yeah, sure. And I've got a question. Uh -huh. How could it be <coughs> if those um, nations are thousands of miles away from each other, that their languages are so similar that they are mutually intelligible? Um, so you're talking about the different Eskimo yeah. languages. Um, I think some of it, I mean, actually, the further away you get, the more different they are. So the Alaskan languages, like the, the Aleut languages, the um, and, and say like Yupik, which is um, in the Eskimo branch, but is, is um, like kind of one of, one of the sub-branches, and then the, the kind of in, the Inuit languages of the other sub-branch are more different. So sort of Alaska and Western Canada, they're more different, but then I think because the migration was quite really late. late. So if you think, you know, like kind of that, that 
the ancestors of modern Greenlandic speakers arrived in Greenland in you know, like around the 13th century, it's actually quite comparable, like you know, to the say the spread of the. I mean, at well, there are some it. changes. Like here, uh, for example, there are more sort of assimilation and more changes when you add endings than in Inuktitut you know, spoken in Canada, but th they're very similar for the most part. But yeah, it's out further. Mm. the kind of the lateness of the migrations. That's the answer. Mm. Just to ask, is, is this by the those are the big compound sort of word sentences that you form into the word? How does that affect having a dictionary? For that? Would you just have the suffixes separate? Because uh, otherwise, you'd have thousands and thousands. So you do have the suffixes separately. They're listed there. Uh, an electronic dictionary is very good for that because you can search separately for the suffixes. You do have them listed. And then you do have words. Some, some of these things become lexicalized. So if you have, I don't know, kaffi so, often enough it becomes an entry of its own in the dictionary. So you don't have to go like from, you know, make them from scratch uh, in the beginning. But yes, they listed, the endings are listed, and some things become lexicalized, and then they're there as units of their own. But quite often you have to do a lot of work on your own, looking up things in the suffix, in the, either in the suffix list or in the dictionary. And that can be one of the challenges, is if you see something, let's say, in the newspaper and you have this giant word, is trying to work out which part of it is a lexeme. So, like, which part will be in the dictionary, and then how many suffixes does it have, and how have they changed? So, like, how much assimilation has there been so that you can work out, mm. isolate the, but the different parts? Yeah, but sometimes one massive word could be just two components. Like, one thing does become lexicalized, and then maybe the negative suffix, but it looks like it looks really big. So. Yeah, that's a great point. <laughs> Just the way of like they stack things, I guess. But Turkish is like um, it's easier because it's not polysynthetic. You still have separate separate words and the verb that the object won't be incorporated into the verb, and they don't code. Maybe can is a suffix in Turkish as well, but they don't code as weird things like uh, as 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 Greenlandic does. But it's similar. So they are agglutinating or concatenating in the sense that they stack endings. Yes. But Turkish, they change less. So when you stack there, there's none of this assimilation business, or less of it at least. So this is slightly more challenging then. It's like kind of one stage down. If you think they're kind of generally thought to be like four different, um, very broad types of languages, the analytic type, the isolating, um, like Mandarin, that you know don't kind of mess with the ends of words <laughs> or the beginnings, and then the inflecting type, like Indo-European languages, and then the agglutinating type, and then polysynthetic is at the top, where they you can put the most into a single word. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's yes. uh, oh my god! Yes. It's like a, a space language. <laughs> I I, would I can't read it, but yes. So it's a political thing. So obviously they want their own alphabet. They want to stand out, but. Um, so it's very similar to this language, but it's hard to read because it, yeah, they have their own syllabary. But luckily, they're online. There are these programs where you can just insert the text written in the syllabary, and it gives you like Latin, and then it's. Oh, but you know Greenlandic know. doesn't use that. Greenlandic, no, this is, no, never. Like Greenlandic is always written in the. In and the I don't know. Is it kind of a dangerous thing to do because it adds another layer to? Do you have to learn that syllabary? And let's say is it language is threatened, is endangered, and then you make it very hard for the for the people to learn, you know, heritage speakers, for example. But it's a political statement, yeah? So they want to have their own alphabet. So cool and it's thing. different, like kind of historically it was different because that, that syllabary was invented. Um, it's, there's a similar one used for Cree in Canada as well. And so it's like a kind of Canadian, um, um, like kind of uh, native language syllabary that was invented. And, it, it, and the history in Greenland was completely different because it was a Danish colony and it didn't have anything to do with that. So they, they just, they never had it. Mm. Other questions? Yes, but there are many rules. <laughs> <laughs> so like there we kind of hit some of this away, but there are the different stem times. Like the nouns can be of sort of three slash seven types, and different things happen. You use a different version of an ending when you attach it to, I don't know, a Q stem and so on. So there, there, there's more to it, but we're kind of not giving you the whole truth. Uh, <laughs> but you saw that there were these little changes that happened, and that's, that's part of it. So I think that's um, the end of the session. session. So again, Kuyanak, thank you very much. Or Kuyanak Suak, a big thank you. Yeah, not as, as, as well. <laughs> no. <laughs>